the Xiong'an New Area, established in 2017 by Communist Party leader Xi Jinping, is located in Hebei Province, a neighboring province to Beijing. As of 2023, the investment to it is already up to 660 billion yuan or 85.3 billion US dollars. However, six years after having been touted as the Millennium Project by the Chinese Communist Party, CCP, and its official media, Xiong'an New Area is becoming an empty ghost city. It's thought to be China's biggest incomplete or rotten-tailed project by the public. On May 10th, Xi Jinping led half of the Standing Committee of the Politburo, the highest decision-making body of the CCP, and a group of state council members, including Premier Li Qiang, to visit the Xiang'an New Area. The visiting team was unusually large, making it a rare event in history. This high-profile visit should be a response to the rumors that Xiang'an is in ruins. It indicates that the grand plan to force a large number of people out of Beijing is imminent. Xi Jinping first inspected the construction and operation of the Xiang'an station. He said in a speech that the central government's decision on the Xiang'an new area is completely correct and that we cannot be impatient, adding that all aspects of Xiang'an's construction work are solid and effective. The development of transport should be given priority to construct a city and develop the economy. You are doing pioneering work in implementing the work of millennial significance. So, what is the message behind Xi Jinping's high-profile visit to Xiang'an? We believe that it's mainly to make sure that the carefully planned Millennium Project championed by him wouldn't stop and become an incomplete project. As an all-powerful leader, he wouldn't stand such a defeat, an assault on his will and authority by the market. He visited Xiang'an for the third time to make sure that the project continued to move forward and not come to a halt. His goal is to make Xiang'an an industrial cluster with central enterprises, universities, and research institutes as its backbone. He personally issued a mobilization order to promote the transfer and relocation to Xiang'an new area of non-capital core functional departments, financial institutions, scientific research institutes, public institutions, commercial, service, and other organizations. In May 2023, Chinese media reported that four central enterprises headquarters and four universities would be relocated to Xiang'an in 2023. Two hospitals accelerated their schedule to move in and at least 30 central enterprises headquarters and secondary and tertiary subsidiaries were striving to settle in the new area in 2023. In 2022, there were only 20 central enterprises registered on site. According to some informed people, the so-called registered on site is just to hang a sign, set up an office, while the staff is still in Beijing. That's why Xi Jinping warned in his speech that we can't follow our own preference but have to move when necessary. We cannot engage in paper evacuation or de facto return, nominally evacuating but returning in reality. It is even worse to set up a second unit in Beijing or use other ways to evacuate on the surface but remain in Beijing in reality. Six years have passed and the grass is growing everywhere in Xiang'an new area, yet Xi Jinping refuses to accept the reality. He insists on developing it and requires local residents in Beijing to relocate there in 2023. Within 15 years, 100 central enterprises and 4.52 million people will have to relocate to Xiang'an. Chinese people made a joke that these 4.52 million people were the chosen ones by Xi. Xi Jinping has picked them out, so they have to move whether they like it or not. In his speeches at the Xiang'an New District Symposium in Beijing, Tianjin, and Hebei, Xi urged the second batch of central enterprises headquarters and secondary and tertiary subsidiaries in Beijing to be relocated to Xiang'an New District as soon as possible. He stressed the importance of not engaging in paper evacuation and de facto return and not creating secondary units in Beijing or other means of expansion while evacuating. This shows that the relocation has met with a lot of opposition and pushback. For example, the four universities which are required to move in March 2023 will no longer retain the Beijing campus and their original campuses. However, these four universities said that they wouldn't give up their original campuses and Beijing campuses and even if they were to open campuses in the Xiang'an new area, they couldn't all be relocated. These universities know very well that if they cancel their original campuses, it is against the principle of maximizing the profits of the universities, especially if they give up their Beijing campuses. 
which could lead to a lower ranking of the universities due to the change in their geographical location. This is something that no university would want to do. In today's China, everything is about the distribution of interests. Imagine the opposition to changing the situation without the motivation of interest. As a result, she is forced to openly bribe his way through economic interests. He said that for policies related to the evacuated personnel, such as education, medical care, housing, salary, social security, medical insurance, and provident funds, it is necessary to further refine and implement policies and measures to ensure that the evacuated unit mandatory benefits. This mandatory benefits. This mandatory approach is she indirectly acknowledging that the market is stronger than his will. Back in 2015, former U.S. Treasury Secretary Henry Paulson revealed in his new book, Dealing with China, that the Xiang'an New Area was Xi Jinping's vision. He plans to incorporate Beijing, Tianjin, and Hebei province with an overall population of 130 million into an economic circle, mainly to decongest Beijing's non-capital functions and to build a new Xiang'an New District, the main receiving area for the decongestion of Beijing's non-capital functions. This will address the big city disease of Beijing, solve the regional ecological environment problem, promote the development of Hebei, and reduce the gap between regions, as well as create a new growth area. This concept isn't wrong. Beijing's functions are becoming more comprehensive. The construction is expanding, and its interior is getting more congested. From this perspective, it is indeed necessary to relieve Beijing's non-capital functions and alleviate the big city disease. But when Xi picks Xiang'an and Hebei for this purpose, there hides a fatal crisis. We did an episode on this topic, and here are five reasons why. First, Xiang'an is located next to the largest lake in Hebei province. Baiyangdian is in the lowest part of the North China Plain, an area that is always below the flood level. Geologists found that geomorphologically, 2,500 years ago, the new Xiang'an area was actually the bottom part of Baiyangdian Lake. Its geological composition is just like the bottom of the dried-up Poyang Lake. In 1963, this area was swallowed by a big flood that went as high as 11.58 meters, and the specific death toll is still unknown. If this new area is to be pushed up as a whole to prevent the kind of flood that occurs once every 200 years, the amount of work would be massive. Wang Wei Luo, a water conservancy expert living in Germany, said in an article before the construction of the new Xiang'an area that because thousands of reservoirs were built in Hebei in the last century, there are no natural rivers flowing all year round in the Haihe River Basin, and Baiyangdian has lost its ability to exist and purify naturally, and water pollution is severe. In an August 2021 interview, Wang reiterated that the geographical site of the Xiang'an new area has major flaws. The Xiang'an new area cannot be built into a large city at all because it is the lowest part of the North China Plain. If the Baiyangdian and Haihe River were to have a once-in-a-century flood, then about 90% of the Xiang'an new area would be wiped out. Secondly, it clearly violates the market law and doesn't follow China's macro flow of economic factors, which is from west to east, making it difficult to attract factors conducive to industrial development especially the concentration of technological innovation factors. Shanghai's Pudong as the outlet of the Yangtze River Delta and Shenzhen as the outlet of the Pearl River Delta have special advantages in terms of their geographic location, but Xiang'an has none of that. The Voice of America quoted a Chinese podcaster. He argued that the level of experimentation of Xiang'an far exceeded that of Pudong and Shenzhen in terms of revitalizing the inland economy and solving the problem of economic decline in northern China. Xiang'an has no port or industry, and even the locals themselves don't have much confidence in it. Developing the Xiang'an new district is like building a mansion in a garbage dump, and people don't want to live there. Third, as the home city of Beijing, there is no clear market incentive for economic and technological innovation factors to move to Xiang'an because Xiang'an doesn't have an environment conducive to the development of such industries. Fourth, imagine if a university in a city as big as Beijing can't do well. After its move to an emerging suburban wilderness, would this university perform better? If a research institute in an integrated urban ecosystem doesn't do well after being isolated in a big compound, what progress can it expect to make? 
Fifth, Beijing is a cultural center, an education center, and a medical center with a large concentration of resources. As a Beijing resident, once they leave Beijing, they won't be able to enjoy these benefits anymore. Who would want to transfer their children out of a Beijing high school to a high school elsewhere? So imagine how reluctant these people are when their companies or organizations are asked to relocate. Even if Xiang'an is built well, it's obvious that people won't want to give up their Beijing residents to settle in Xiang'an. And if they can keep their Beijing residents, Xiang'an is just a place to work and Beijing is still their life focus. Some urban planners believe that the population size of the new Xiang'an area must reach at least 15 million in order to have the potential to drive large-scale economic development. The current population is only 5 million, obviously insufficient. Compared to the larger population of neighboring cities like Beijing and Tianjin, Xiang'an needs to have a large enough population to be competitive. So we see what we saw at the beginning. This includes the construction of the Xiang'an High-Speed Railway Station, the largest in Asia, occupying 66 soccer fields. It has been open for two years, but there is only a train a day to Beijing. A netizen sarcastically said, I believe the Great Leader's Millennium Plan will be completed in a thousand years. Some netizens left comments saying, To open a company in Chang'an is an administrative order, not a result of the natural development of the economy. The investment without regard to the outcome will ultimately become a rotten tail project. The Xiang'an new area actually imposes a significant amount of political pressure on Xi Jinping. However, he is a strong personality and won't back down, so he strongly supports Xiong'an. During this trip to Xiong'an, firstly, he brought three members of the Politburo Standing Committee, including Li Qiang, especially the chairman and the premier, Xi and Li, in the same frame. It's a rare event intended to counter the opposition. Secondly, he said that the new Xiong'an area has gone from nothing to a modern city of high level, rising up to be a miracle. The reality proves that the Party Central Committee's major decision on building the Xiong'an new area is completely correct and the progress on all fronts is solid and effective. However, Xi's hardline approach isn't enough to silence the opposition. On the contrary, the lack of a corrective mechanism is turning the Xiong'an new area into a vortex. The more investment, the less likely it will stop. And when it doesn't stop, more investment is needed. China's economy is in turmoil and its finances are getting tighter. The Xiong'an new area has become a bottomless pit, which will be more and more politically damaging to Xi. The public has also seen that after six years of construction, the Xiong'an district has failed to shoulder the promises made in its early planning years. The issue of talent and population is one of the biggest points of resistance. It's true that its relocation has met with all kinds of soft resistance. As people who make decisions based on their survival instinct, it's an irresistible trend that they will concentrate on areas with more job opportunities and a more developed economy. It is impossible to directly counteract this general trend by removing the population from the central parts of Beijing. Against all odds, the only way to make people move to Xiong'an is to force them to do so. This was the case in 2017, when the Beijing municipal government forcibly evicted the so-called low-end population and people took to the streets in protest. The eviction of the low-end population was interpreted at the time by some analysts as a measure taken by the mayor of Beijing to curry favor with Xi Jinping. Officials were trying to force Beijing's population to move to the Xiong'an new district. However, neither businesses nor Beijing residents wanted to move there, and the district eventually became an empty ghost town. Relocating the central enterprises, research institutes, and universities out of Beijing and transferring the non-capital functions of Beijing is even more tricky as it impacts people's core interests. These are powerful people inside the system, and because of China's unique administrative system, Beijing has the best resources in the nation, so who wants to leave? The essence of decentralization is the forcible tearing apart and restructuring of the existing interest pattern, making it a fierce fight to the death. Despite the high political pressure, there are only three evacuated central enterprises, which have started work on their headquarters, and China Mineral Resources Group has chosen a site to locate. 
The first four universities and two hospitals to be relocated are steadily advancing their work. In official lingo, it has entered a critical period of synergy between the central units and relevant local areas. Xi Jinping rose through the ranks from the deputy county party secretary. He certainly knows the realities of the Communist Party system and the inner workings of the vested parties, and he naturally understands that the decongestion is a fight. Xi's iron fist will further turn him into an enemy of the high-class people living in Beijing. The focus of Xi's trip to Hebei is to promote the construction of Xiong'an New Area and the deconstruction of Beijing in order to pressure the state council to make the second batch of deconstruction tasks an important priority for its work. Previously, the former premier, Li Keqiang, wasn't active in the construction of Xiong'an New Area and the deconstruction of Beijing's functions during his term of office. Xi was very unhappy. Now that the state council has been replaced by his own people, the new premier is expected to put in the effort and do a good job on this matter. Like the new premier, local officials, large and small, said in TV interviews that the decision of the general secretary, Xi Jinping, is wise and great. This year marks the sixth anniversary of the establishment of the Xiong'an New Area. After mapping out a development plan in the early stage, we have been pushing forward the construction of the project in the past two years, which has made rapid progress. Starting from scratch, the new area now has road networks covering both the downtown and outskirt areas and infrastructural facilities supplying water, electricity, gas and telecommunication services. In the new area, we also planted 31,300 hectares of trees, restored river systems, built parks and increased green space. During this visit, President Xi has given more specific instructions to us. Therefore, our next job is to implement these instructions and make our contribution to fulfill the plan of the millennium for this city with a bright future. The plan for building the new area was released when I was still studying in college, and I felt honored that it would include my hometown, which is now a new place with new development and new opportunities. That has prompted me to improve myself. In the future, I will keep General Secretary Xi Jinping's instructions in mind and make progress in serving the people in a more down-to-earth and specific manner. In the next step, our work will mainly center on full coverage of party building at the grassroots level, settlement of problems in grassroots level governance, and fostering new work styles in volunteer services, so as to help the residents better adapt to new city life and speed up the building of a harmonious community based on collaboration, public involvement, and shared benefits. This may be the major reason why Xi Jinping is unable to see reality. He is under the spell of some Marxist think tanks who believe in the government's will and bureaucratic power. The state-directed market is made to play a decisive role in the allocation of resources. Instead of recognizing its deviation from market rules and adjusting the project, Xi Jinping takes on a big political gamble forcing the project forward. This will not only make him more impeded politically, but also induce divisions within his own camp, intensify the secret fighting between factions within the party, and make the CCP's political situation more treacherous and unpredictable. Not allowing the market to play any role, this state-led, top-down approach has led to countless failures under the CCP's regime. Now it seems clear that as long as Xi Jinping is in power, Xiong'an will be built. It's his vanity project. The money will continue to be invested, and the game will continue to be played until the CCP runs out of money. Then the project's rotten-tailed nature will be completely exposed.